Ladies and gents, my name is Brandon Stover. Welcome to the How to Solve Climate Change course from Plato University. Causes, systems, obstacles, solutions to this global challenge is what you're going to learn here today. When you're ready to learn more skills, join us for free at Plato.University. Let's get started with today's lesson. We'll have our expert guests briefly introduce themselves and their credentials for why they are able to speak to this topic. I'm Bill Moulin, William R. Moulin in the professional world. I'm a, a professor emeritus from Tufts University and a distinguished visiting scientist at the Woodwell Climate Research Center. And I've spent, well, since the late 1980s working pretty much exclusively on, on climate change. And the last maybe 15 years, I began shifted from all the work I did with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. I was a lead author on five reports over a 20 year period, mostly focused on the technological solutions and the energy saving solutions and so on. And about 15 years ago, I took another look at something that's just taken for granted in all of the analyses, which is that. This remarkable fact that the increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere every year is less than half of what we put in. And well, that's pretty remarkable. Okay. It occurred to me, what could we do to increase it? If it's already doing that, could it do more? And the answer is in the world of forests and land management, it certainly could be doing much more. So that's how I, how I got into this particular area and I work closely with carbon cycle scientists and forest ecologists who, and, and wetland scientists, those are kind of my, that's my, my working circle right now. Could you explain succinctly what forests as carbon sinks are from a first principles perspective? Sure. If, if you, it, it's actually taken quite a while to work this all out. Uh, because forests are in wetlands and grasslands are distributed around the world. So the question was, where is this carbon all going? And it turns out uh, the best estimate now is that if you look at the annual emissions from uh, fossil fuels, that 31% of the removal is by, by forests and plants on land. Most of that is over 90% of that is, is by, by forests and 25% uh, is by oceans. And so these are the two great systems that we consider to be basically exploitable natural resources. And we've been exploiting them for, you know, pretty bit much the last 300 years, very intensely the last 50 years. And so the question, the, the questions of whether they'll keep this up or not, obviously we keep destroying the forests and, and the wetlands that then release methane, which is a very potent greenhouse heat trapping gas, but that number is going to, going to change and it's not going to change in the right direction. Can you expand on why forests help to solve climate change? Okay. Well, here's, here's the way things work. The, ever since forests appeared about between three and 400 million years ago, after being wiped out by the meteor, they came back again with a, with a vengeance. They have been, they, they, they have this remarkable process, which we have yet to be able to replicate, which is called photosynthesis. Basically, uh, wood is made directly from air and water. And uh, it's a uh, light that uh, provides the energy to put those together to make wood. I mean, that's pretty extraordinary. If you look at a piece of wood, that's, you know, really pretty complex material. I mean, it, and, it, and it's remarkable in its properties and so on. And about uh, half of the dry weight of wood is carbon. And uh, carbon dioxide is, is, uh, it is a carbon with two oxygens on it. And it's, it's uh, naturally in the atmosphere. And the leaves of trees bring it in and extract the very small amount. It's less, just about four one hundredths of a percent of the atmosphere and turn it into wood. And in that form, the, the wood fibers, it can there as long as the, as long as the trees are standing. And even after they die, the carbon about, you know, a high percentage of the carbon is still in a, in a dead tree that's standing. And also as, as branches fall and leaves fall, they decompose and they become organic carbon in the soils. And, and so that's, that's a really, really long-term storage basket. And because forests are dynamic, that is the, they are being born, they grow, they absorb carbon dioxide, they die. They decay. Some of that goes in back into the atmosphere. Some of it goes into the soil. It's it's not like you put it in a in a in a box and put a lock on it, you know. And so it's it's easy to disrupt it, but it's also hard 
it, it's 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 more difficult than you might think because these uh, so far at least the forests have been quite durable, although we're changing that with the climate, we're making them more vulnerable. Yeah, could you possibly expand on how forests may not work as a solution or fall short of being a solution? Well, the the way they'd fall short is that we harvest too many of them. We clear them for agriculture. This is the big loss in uh, Brazil, for example, is being being cleared to produce beef and and the soy, which is exported to China and the rest of the world. And and so those those forests are gone. It's very hard to bring them back. Our forests in well, we have of course multiple types of forests in the United States. I mean, in the eastern United States, there are a mix of hardwoods and softwoods. That is oak trees and maple trees and, and birch trees and so forth, and, and then pines and, and hemlocks and other, other trees. And in the Pacific Northwest, there are huge fir trees and others that are just extraordinary in size, the ones that are left. But in 120 years, they've, they've removed a good portion of it, but there's still a lot there. And what is there, those trees are, you know, many of them are 500 years, 800 years old. And they're still growing and still removing carbon dioxide. So there's a myth that uh, trees uh, stop growing and basically just stand there and don't fall till they fall over and die, which is just not true. I mean, at some point they do fall over and die, but yeah, the, less than 5% of, of our, our forests in the lower 48 states are more than 100 years old. So these are trees that have an expected lifetime of 200 to 500 years. Well, you know, 100 is barely adolescent, right? And so they haven't even entered their adolescent growth spurt. And uh, so if we would allow more of these forests to keep growing, we would get an, up, an, an increase in, in the removal of carbon dioxide by our forests. Who might benefit and who might be harmed by implementing forests as a solution? Well, I mean, we are already counting on it as a solution. We talk about being net zero by 2050. And what does that mean? It's not zero that we're emitting zero carbon. It just means that uh, what we're emitting any, any, anything we're emitting from fossil fuels and uh, other sources of carbon dioxide is being absorbed by our, uh, by our forests and other plants on land. And so, and so everybody's kind of going to the edge on this. In, in Massachusetts, we've said we'll be reducing our carbon dioxide emissions by, 50, by 85%. And that just implicitly assumes that 15% will be removed by our forests. Well, Maybe, maybe not. You know, we have to do something about making sure the forests are there in order for that to happen. And net zero, the point when the natural world is taking out as much as we're putting in, is, is just a transition point. If you read the full report on this, it then has to be net negative after that. That is, the natural world has to be removing more than we are putting in if we are to stay uh, below this uh, one and a half degrees Celsius, 2.7 degree Fahrenheit increase. And we're already, we're already up to two degrees Fahrenheit warmer for the world. And so we don't, ha we don't have space. I mean, it's just not going to be possible to, to stay within that. What happens if we go over? Well, if we, it, there's not a sharp definition there, but much above that, you start seeing irreversible changes. We're already seeing some irreversible changes, but there will be more that will be impossible to, 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 to change. The, the damage will be permanent. And some of that damage are things like, well, we're already, already sea level uh, rise is, no matter what we do, is permanent for the next thousand years or so, right? It's the acidity of the ocean is permanent for a thousand years or more. You know, a thousand years is 40 generations. That's a lot of people to disadvantage from just our negligence. The, the, the intense weather events and wild fluctuations, if we can get that under control, that, can, that will, will slow down and be reversed if we, if we stay below about, one, about the 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit number. If we go much above it, they will continue to get worse. And the thing to remember is if we overshoot, they say, oh, we'll overshoot, we'll come back. But the overshoot means there's more carbon dioxide traffic heat in the atmosphere. And, and, and we know that that will cause more damage. There will be more intense storms. There'll be more droughts. There'll be more floods. There'll be more wildfires. Those are not fixed when you get the atmospheric carbon dioxide back down a little bit, right? The, 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 yeah, the people who are killed, the, the lands that are, that, are, that are permanently damaged don't come back. The glaciers that have melted don't refreeze when you get the carbon back to where it was, right? 
So it's it, a phrase that I like is that eventual uh, carbon neutrality is not not climate neutrality, right? And it's really the climate that we want to work uh, to 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 get back to something more comfortable, and and reducing carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is a way to go about it. In fact. Halting the growth is important, but I think our goal should be more ambitious. We should be talking about how do we, how do we remove more of it? How do we, as somebody said, how do we refreeze the Arctic? Well, the only way to do that is to make the earth less warm. And the only way to do that is to remove more carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere in a permanent way. Speaking to forests, could you talk a little bit about how this would work as a solution? Speaking to maybe how much land we would need in order to remove a certain amount of carbon? Yeah, we have we we have plenty of land in forests in the United States, but it's all been managed for uh, production, or, or I should say, seventy percent of it's been managed for production. About half of the rest of it is in what are called, in fact, the, the Forest Service calls calls seventy percent of all the forests in the United States timberlands. I'm not, that, that's not a subtle term, and it it means that of the of the remaining, about half of that is is a reserve forest, which means they're in national parks that are not harvested. The other half of that, the other 15% or so, are just forests that have no value for timber production, right? It just, they're, they're little, little scruffy trees, but it's a forest, okay? So we have to focus on this 70% and say, these are the forests that grew the big trees. And we need to let those big trees that are there stay. And we need to, we need to allow more, more trees to uh, become big. And I'll give you an example of why. We're, this is not the only study that shows this, but it's one that, we, that I was involved with. In Oregon, back in the 1990s, there was something called the spotted owl crisis because they were cutting old growth forests and, and the spotted owl needed old growth forests. So the Forest Service put a limit on not, you could not cut trees more than 21 inches in diameter in these forests. And that would leave enough old growth forests for the spotted owl. That worked. It, it saved them. Two years ago, so the Forest Service decided to remove that restriction. And so a young colleague named David Milton Drexler contacted me and some other senior people and said, we have found a U.S. Forest Service database where they have measured something like 700,000 trees in those, those uh, six national forests. And they, so we know the size of them. And then we can calculate how much carbon there is. And what we found was that just 3% of the trees were bigger than 21 inches, but they held 42% of the carbon of all the trees. Well, that's astounding. That didn't even count how much more there is in the soils around those, those big trees. So, you know, big trees matter and allowing trees to grow to be big trees matters. And so that's really the strategy. And I and some colleagues published a paper in 2019, which basically said, you know, we talk about reforestation. We replant after we cut down a forest and afforestation when we plant trees where we want to plant trees and a lot of good news about planting trees, but those trees will not do much by 2030, certainly, or even by 2050, and they'll do a bit by 2100. But what would do something would be to allow existing forest to continue growing. Some, some fraction of them, half maybe, some would be, even if we got a third, it would be great. And we gave that a name. We called it proforestation. Because forestation means to grow a forest and proforestation means that's what we're going to do. <laughs> and it's not met with great, great applause from the forestry industry, not surprisingly. Yeah. Because they've had access to all of it and they want to keep access to all of it. And in the latest Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report that I had nothing to do with, I've been out of that business for 10 years, it, it stated that essentially that, 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 that the growing existing forests, we, we find proforestation is, is uh, managing forests to achieve their carbon accumulation potential and for biodiversity. Okay. So simple definition. And, and what it would mean is that uh, if we did some fraction of our forests and let them grow that way, that would be enough to probably make, make significant difference in the uh, buildup of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And the IPCC said that that was the, was the priority action for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. I wish they'd said additions to the atmosphere. That's a little more accurate as to what it is. What are some of the best resources to learn about forests in relation to climate change? The best resources for, for people who don't want to get into all the technical details, there's, there's a, a, a website called Fee Conversation. 
And a lot of us have converted our papers into a plain English version that's about 800 or 1,000 words long with lots of good information and data. And uh, the conversation does a wonderful job of publishing these with, with uh, graphics. And in some cases, they even have done some with videos that they've found that make the point, you know, more strongly. And so these are all done by people who have uh, qualifications, scientific qualifications. And they have, they have a wonderfully brutal fact-checking system and, 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 and a wonderful sense of, of editing. So, you know, if you start getting too techy in your descriptions, they suggest alternative English words that more people would understand. So I think it's a great place to go. And in fact, a lot of the media uh, go to that, that source for, for stories. Uh, and there's even a little scorecard that you get about uh, how many, you know, how many, I don't know, uh, CBS reported on this using the, the this article. Uh, it was published in, it, it was mentioned in uh, the following. Uh, newspapers will, 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 will use it as the basis of a story. Uh, it, it's very, very useful as a way to get the word out to a broader public. Right now, you're speaking to passionate students who want to actually solve problems like these. What top three skills should they study so that they actually have the ability to do so? Well, if they wanted to work in this field, which is, is called natural climate solutions, some people call it nature-based climate solutions, but nature-based climate solutions include things like cutting down more trees and building wood buildings so the, so the carbon will be stored in the wood. But the problem with that, that's true, it does store a lot in, in the wood, but there is more carbon, carbon released when you cut down a tree and turn it into a board than you save in the building. So I prefer to, I mean, yes, we're going to do that. That's fine. But if we really want to solve the problem, we need, we need natural climate solutions in which nature is allowed to make, make the, uh, make the decisions, if you like. The, the skills needed for that are, well, there's several. One is, is, is to study forest ecology. And I never had the benefit of that. I'm coming at this from the, from the perspective of a physical scientist who figured this out and then went and found the experts to work with so we could put it all together. And the second one is to be willing to do that, to, to not get locked into a narrow field of, uh, of research, but to make your goal, well, to just to figure out, okay, here's what I bring to this, but what am I missing? And then work with the people who fill in those gaps. And when you work together with other people, it's amazing the kind of, of findings you have. It, it's, it, it, is, it is what has been moving the discussion along in the, in the last few years is this collaborative work. So, you know, having a specialty is important. You, you need to be really knowledgeable about something. And, but at the same time, you need to recognize that every specialty has boundaries and nature has no boundaries. So, so if you, if you, if you try to impose boundaries on nature, you are going to miss an awful lot of what's really going on. Any final recommendations for the audience? Well, I, I mean, I taught regular courses for 50 years and then I, for the last nine years, have still been teaching a couple of specialty courses. So I've been with a lot of students, both undergraduates and graduate students. And I, I love the, the enthusiasm and the commitment and the, 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 the mental agility that younger people have because they haven't been kind of locked into a certain way of thinking about things. And I can honestly say that I've learned, I'm sure I've learned as much or more from my students over the years as they've learned from me. I've given them a framework and I have the knowledge about what's going on. And then they take that and run with it. And it's just, it's just enormously impressive with what, what they're able to do at a very much earlier stage in their career than I did. I mean, they fit it out much, much earlier. And so I, I urge them to go into to this field or any other field that's addressing a major global issue that we're facing. Climate change is not the only one. I mean, biodiversity is the other big one. Those are the two big ones. Probably from human point of view, these, the, these, these, these disease, you know, the, these huge disease attacks that we're experiencing, we're going to get more of those because among other things, we're destroying the very landscape that is holding these viruses and things in check. And, and we're just making the world ourselves more vulnerable by the way we manage the world. So, you know, pick an area, go into it. And, and we, we really, we really need that help. And it's not just doing the science, it's implementing it. If you can get into a position of implementation 
And that means maybe going into, into the corporate world, maybe going into the banking. I, I think the biggest lever we have, of course, is finance. If we didn't finance all these bad things, they wouldn't happen. So, you know, that's, that's, that's more effective than chaining yourself to a tree, right? It's, it's, it's not maybe not as, as, as pleasing in one way or another, but it's re really more effective. So all of those are possibilities. And I just encourage young people to follow their, their, follow your passion and, and, and just, you know, have it lead you into doing these good works. Let's practice some of the skills related to this topic. Choose a degraded area and develop a reforestation or a forestation plan for that area. Include species selection, planting strategies, and projected ecological benefits. Thank you for taking the How to Solve Climate Change course. If you want to learn the skills to solve this global challenge, join us for free at Plato.University for exclusive content, extra resources, and actionable exercises with every lesson. This course was produced by Plato University, where students turn passions into purpose and learn skills to change the world. Learn more at Plato.University.